I'm Jim Moore, the president of Appalachian Region, and for those who don't know me, one thing we always try to do with the start of our events is to make sure we know who's new to the region or, or even new to the events. So if you're here for your first or second time at one of our events, if you could stand up and uh, just say your name, I would appreciate it. I'm going to start because I know uh, you're new here. So. Welcome, Eugene. Whoop. I'm John Van Nice. I've been a member for a couple of years. But First time coming. Time. That's great. I'm Diane McCann. Also been with the club for about a year and a half, and this is my first event. So. All right. We're going to get you out driving, I yeah. understand. Oh, yeah. so that's good. Judith? Judy Arnold. And I've been with the club for quite a few years, but I've only been to one other event. Okay. Well, hopefully you're driving after this. Uh, I'm Dean Gurnack, and uh, I've been a member for a couple months. First event. Great. Thank you, Dean. And I know you're driving this or at the car control clinic this weekend. Yes. Yeah, great. Chuck Mills, new. Thank you. Jeff Edison, joined last year, but been back in the area in about five years. Thank you. Okay, great. I'm Alan Peacock, uh, migrant from Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> I always like the migrants. We've got uh, a lot, a lot of people moving in this area. And Jeff. Yeah, so, Jeff Gross. I'm up in Cedar Mountains. My first, first event here. Yeah, okay, great. Well, we've got uh, a big night plan. I don't know if you're ready for your introduction yet, Dan. Or uh, yep. Okay. Dan Dazzle is our. Uh, Chief Driving Instructor for the region. He's a transplant here from several years ago from the Potomac uh, area where he uh, ran a lot of their driving events up there. He is also with PCA National. He's the safety chairman within all PCA across America. So you will uh, see Dan's name often in national events. He also most recently was the Maryland Police and Correctional Training Commission's Driver Training Facility in Police Academy. <laughs> 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 you didn't have that one written down. But, yeah. uh, you all that on the name tag? Yeah. No. But he, he ran a training facility. I'll take it down to the bare bones. He ran a training facility to train uh, law enforcement on how to drive in special situations. So that's why he's ideal for training us how to drive with our Porsches, which require different driving skills, especially in the mountains of North Carolina, as opposed to a lot of the flatlands where many of us have moved from. So with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Dan. Where did the inmate plot come from? Did you train inmates to drive as well? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Correctional officers. Okay. <laughs> it's your show, Dan. Thanks, Jim. Right. Thank all right, as Jim indicated, um, I'm a member of PCA, of course. I've been uh, in the club since 1974, and I became an instructor in 1979, a PCA instructor. So, I, But I've instructed, as Jim indicated, with other venues a lot. So let me, I'll go through my professional career first, career, I should say. My first major career was I was a homicide detective in D.C. for 25 years, from 69 to late 94. Um, during that time, I also assisted our, our department, D.C. department, with um, EVO, we call it, emergency vehicle operations. And that's my second career. After I retired there a couple years later, I was fortunate enough to open up for the state of Maryland a driver training facility under the Maryland Police and Correctional Training Commission. I make that clear because Jim did the same thing. If you noticed on the email you all got about my references, he said Maryland State Police. And a lot of people assume that right away. Oh, you trained the Maryland State Police. Yes, but I trained all the other officers in the <laughs> state of Maryland. Plus, most of the states up and down the East Coast and several across the country, plus, Canadian Mounted Police, Mexican <laughs> officers, Korean officers, South Korea, Bobby's in England, <laughs> on it, some German officers, yada, yada, yada. My facility, my second career in opening up that facility, I was fortunate to be one of the first two instructors and I developed most of the programs there, and then about four years later, I became the administrator. At the same time, I was also 
teaching in various colleges as an adjunct instructor in numerous police academies, numerous criminal justice courses, particularly um, death investigations and inter interview and interrogations, and then constitutional law. During the same time, when I was with the Porsche Club, as an instructor, I was, from 79 on, I was working and teaching in our HPDEs, the driver's education programs, as well as autocross, and, and also I was part of the 10 people that started PCA club race program. Several of us were doing vintage racing and we said, why isn't Porsche Club doing racing? And so we got it started. It was an endeavor, but in 1994, we were able to get the program going. Also during that time, I was working with BSR, Bill Scott Raceway, which is Summit Point, West Virginia, doing anti-terrorist training. And I trained numerous uh, State Department, federal officials, military groups, as well as police agencies. And I did that for about 15 years. That was a part-time gig while I was doing my police work. So I have a little bit of training experience. <laughs> now, I know that's a lot I threw out at you, but here's a point I like to make, and I do it with all my instructors. I do it when I, when I uh, do instructor schools. Um, in all my classrooms, I want everyone here, I know all of you have been driving a lot, correct? <laughs> I've been racing since 1966, so I've been driving a little longer. And I know some of you have probably been driving longer than me. What I ask is, you have a lot of experience, we have a lot of experience, but I found and I always tell my students that I always learn every day and that one of you or many of you will teach me something. It may be I never want to get in the car next to you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's what I want. I want to loosen you up right now. I expect the laugher. It is a joke. I always get in the right front seat. I did it this weekend. I helped run their instructor school with uh, Carolina Regents at, at uh, Carolina Motorsport Park. And then the next two days, I was in the right front seat um, teaching. The first day was kind of difficult, <laughs> but then the second day, the, I'd say two light bulbs came on with my student. <laughs> and the first day, it was a little serious because the car we were in was a 2016 Mercedes AMG, 600 horsepower. And the first session out, he used every bit of it. <laughs> Fortunately, I was able to reel him in. <laughs> and kind of like start over, because this was not supposed to be a green, green, or a very beginning student. He was supposed to have some experience. So it was like the first day he forgot everything that we had to relearn. But the second day, it was pop. He started driving. He almost lapped every car in his uh, group, which was kind of, kind of a really good accomplishment. Um, so it worked out. But I learned something from that. I learned about, which he didn't know, we found out that the car had uh, collision avoidance. <laughs> and when you were out on the racetrack or on the road course, doing even DE education, as soon as you get close to somebody and you want to pass, the brakes go on. Oh. <laughs> the first indicator was my seatbelt cinched up, his did too, but mine cinched up and then the seat moved back all the way. <laughs> and then his car almost came to a stop and I'm, and I'm not screaming, but I'm talking loudly through the communicator, get off the brake. <laughs> and he's going, I'm not on the brake. <laughs> so I knew then what was going on and immediately we went in the pits and corrected. Figured out a way to turn it off. And that's a point for the rest of you, because I know some of you probably have on your Porsches, yeah. right? Accident, collision avoidance. I don't think they don't call it collision avoidance. What do they say? Or maybe they do. ACC. Okay. Accident avoidance. There you go. But, but if you come to a, 
If you take it with your car and you have that on there, you have to demonstrate before you go out, you have to turn it off. And the problem is, every time you turn off the car and restart it, it resets itself. So you gotta turn it off every time. So, it was a learning process, okay? And that, and what I'm asking you is, keep an open mind, all right? We all learn something, and that's what I'm asking here. Now, uh, uh, some other things. I'm gonna go through uh, driving techniques, vehicle dynamics, and car control. And some of the, my presentations, to get the point across, I kind of make it simple. And don't, simple in the way is, do I have any engineers in here? <laughs> All right, don't get upset <laughs> with what I'm doing. Some, you know, I'll explain it. I kind of like make it real simple so that everybody, it goes, oh yeah, I got it. All right, without getting into the, so I can talk about a friction circle but not actually have a friction circle. I demonstrated it a different way. But there's some other, do we have a seat? Oh, go ahead. I'm comfortable. All right. That's a place I pick on people. <laughs> so in essence, I, I, I like to make, so that everyone gets it, it's real, you know, I don't have to go into a lengthy explanation. The engineers, you'll, when I explain it, you'll go, okay, he's, he's close. <laughs> it may not be exactly right, but when you, and there will be one, one particular area where I get the biggest grief and I go, okay, let's go, we'll talk about this. And then you'll go, oh yeah, that makes sense, it does, all right. <laughs> so. One other thing, if you heard, you saw me up here with the video technician, <laughs> The PowerPoint has five videos embedded in it. It did. <laughs> Dave asked me to make sure I could put, you know, instead of relying on my laptop to put everything on a stick, which I did, made sure it's all embedded, have the extra videos separately so if I go in there it should play. And for some reason they're not. I think one will play. The other, the three most important one, you can hear the sound, but it's not showing any, it's black. I don't know why it's not showing. So I apologize for that, but I'll talk, I'll talk us through it. It's just, there's some really good videos from Bosch that explain uh, accident avoidance and uh, ABS. So, so let's get moving. Now, some of you are coming to the hands-on driving clinic this Saturday, correct? Yes. Who is? Let's see. Okay, good. Very good. All right. And then the rest of you are planning, you wanted to see more about our driving techniques, correct? But also, are you going to do tours, as we suggested? Okay. Good. What I'm explaining, driving techniques and vehicle uh, dynamics and car control, it's the same if I was teaching a bunch of racers. It's the same that I teach police officers. It's the same if I do street survival, which is a BMW program for teens that have already gone through a driver's education, but this is advanced and it, it gives them what they should have got in driver's education and didn't. And what we found there is with the street survival, we invite the parents have come along and to assist us on the actual exercises out there. And at the end of the day, they all come to us and say, can we go through this? <laughs> we didn't get this in DE. We came close, but there's a lot there that we didn't, we didn't get. And so it's, it's um, now for it, the other entities I, I referenced to, of course, once you get the basics, then you go in different directions in how you're gonna do it. And then there's advanced techniques. But it's all the same. The basics are the same, okay? The dynamics work the same. Physics works the same. So that's what we're gonna get into. So, we're gonna cover, cover a couple areas. Um, how to use your car to the full potential. The best safe performance is to maximize traction. How does a car work? 
on the roadway. What connects the car to the roadway? Tires. Who said it? Tires. Right. Tires. You have four tires on most of our Porsche vehicles. Unless you're driving a, a truck with six or 16 wheels, whatever. But the tires make the connection. And we call it the footprint for the traction area. Okay? And I don't care how big your tire is, how much the vehicle weighs, most of the time that traction is about the size of the palm of your hand. That's it. <coughs> now, if you add more weight, it'll get a little bit bigger, but then you can overweight the tire. So it's close most of the time to the size of your hand, the palm, all right? We want to learn how to maximize that traction. We want to be proactive in doing it. We want to use proper vision techniques. And everything we do with the vehicle, the inputs should be as smooth as possible. Smooth as possible. Steering inputs, gas inputs, braking inputs, even, a, even a avoidance that we have to get out of trouble. <coughs> we want to try and slow down and give nice smooth inputs. And then because why? We want to regain what? Traction. traction. Regain traction. I tried to find my, uh, well I did, my uh, laser pointer and it stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> this is my, this was my grandfather's who also taught vehicle dynamics and stuff, but that was back in the early 1900s, so the control All right. Wrong way. So, the ability to interpret vehicle language and grasp vehicle dynamics forms the basis for all driving. The better you can understand that, the better you, you'll be able to perform and drive. <clears throat> what are we talking about when I say vehicle language? Feedback through the steering. Okay, that's one way. Feedback through the steering. What's, what, what's that feedback? What is it actually? What's going on? What feedback are you getting through the steering? Sorry, what the tires are doing. Which tires? Generally the front ones. Very good, the front tires, correct. So, how would you tell, get vibrations from the rear tires? Where are you going to feel that? What? In your butt. That's right. Lower back in your butt. You'll see one of the first, the next one or two slides I'm going to put up is we're going to talk about seat position. And one of the things I'll remind you of is I want you to sit in the seat, not just on the seat. Because you need to get that information. What other language are you going to get? Think of your senses. Sound. We already talked about feel. What? Sound. Hearing. Yeah. Will the tires talk to you? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. If they're working good, it's going to be a sweet sound. It might be a little squeal, but it'll be a good squeal. If you go beyond that, it'll be what I call a squall. <laughs> it won't sound right. It won't feel right. You'll probably be going sideways. And then you'll know it isn't right. <laughs> What else? Sound of the engine? Yeah. Right? How about the brakes? Can you, you'll hear maybe the brakes squealing? If you overwork the brakes and they start smoking, you babe might smell them. <laughs> or if you lock up, you don't have ABS, you lock up the front tires in a braking situation, you're gonna smell the tires burning off the roadway. So these are the, that's the language we're referring to, okay? The car will talk to you. No, it won't be like maybe in the future, but remember a couple years ago where Nissan had, your door is a jar. <laughs> and some of us going, no, it's a door. <laughs> okay, it's open, close the door. It won't be that way, all right? So. Right now we're going to go through seating position, then we'll three types of weight change, tire pressure, braking, progressive threshold, ABS, three types of skids, Oops. 
and offer a recovery. After we go through that section, then we're going to go into mountain driving, some cues, safety cues. I'll, I'll give you some hints of how you can go on our tours because we do most of our tours in the mountains. And, and to make it fun and safe. And safe. All right? And, we, you know, why do you want to go out in the mountains? Curvy roads? And you want to push the performance a little bit? Yeah, we all do. Yeah, sure. That's why we do it. But we want to do it safely. And we have a procedure to do that. And that's pretty much why I started doing this for our tour of drivers. So that we stay safe. And it kind of is a refresher from our DE days. <laughs> all right. So, sitting and steering. Proper sitting position. I want you to sit in the seat, not just on the seat. When you make the adjustment, I don't want you sitting. Oh yeah, I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen that. A lot of youngsters, especially in the city environment, they're there leaning back. And now, uh, you know why they're leaning back? They've got their head is right even with the uh, seat pillar. Okay, anybody know why? Protection! <laughs> well, there's Aaron Browns that may be going through this. <laughs> Some others are just, they will look cool. I think I'm cool, I'm gonna sit that way. It's not cool to drive. It's not a good way to drive. So, adjust the seat so that your legs still have a slight bend in them, operate the pedals. And a good way is, you know, when you have the seat adjusted, push down if you have a clutch. If you don't, if you have PDK or automatic, push on the brake pedal. But just see that while you're doing that, you're not extending your leg all the way out. You want to have still a slight bend, okay? The rake of the back, seat back, same thing. When you're holding the steering wheel, you want to have a slight bend, okay? A good way to check... Ah, now I know I forgot, and it's in my vehicle, and I'll get it when we take a break. I have a steering wheel and a pedal cluster to assist us, especially if some of us want to know how to heel and toe with their, auto, with their manual. I can show you how to do that. On the steering wheel, holding that. Nine and three, ten and two. I'm talking, I'm referring to a clock, okay? In fact, if you look at most of your cars, your Porsche steering wheels, you'll see at nine and three, where your thumbs rest on them is a little extension of the steering wheel, which is 10 and two. What do you think Porsche is trying to tell you? <laughs> Same thing I am. Now, some of us, if you're, let's see, do I have any youngsters in here? <laughs> I am Dan. Yeah. <laughs> I used to call the kids that came, see, the kids that came through my facility, you know, kids. And, and even the officers that are coming back for a refresher course, I still call them kids. You know, they were in their 40s, and I'm calling them a kid. And they were, actually, to me. In DE, a lot of states are teaching this. They want the they want the drivers to hold the wheel at eight and four. Why do you think? Airbags. Airbags. And I go, that's that's totally crazy. That's useless. And the problem with that is, and you'll see this, drivers that do that, when they start driving, especially at higher speeds, and they start turning the wheel, they start turning their shoulders, and then the car starts going like this. It's not smooth, it's not precise. And I got the state of Maryland to stop doing that, the, the programs they were doing. So they went back to this, nine and three and 10 and two. Even in those positions, if the airbag goes off, my hands are going like this. <laughs> I may get some burns here, but it pushes it away naturally, okay? If you tend to do this, 11 and one, which a lot of us do when we first get into um, the DE program, when we get out on the road course and we start going faster and our hands start slipping up here. And sometimes it goes like this, all right? And we will, we will remind you, put your hands back at nine and three. It's just automatic, you know, you start creeping up. 
But this is bad. This is really bad. One hand at 12 o'clock. How many of us do that? Come on. <laughs> Maybe Come on. Not in the porch. <laughs> we shouldn't be doing it in any car with airbags. Because, and, and talk to emergency room physicians, you have friends that are doctors, and, and one of my, my instructors from almost as long as me, uh, Susan Kimmett, ran an emergency room around the DC area, and she said, yep, they, a couple times, people would come in with a ring embedded in their forehead. Uh -huh. The airbag is what? It's going to come out, and where's this hand going? It can't go like this, it's going to immediately go like that. So that's a no-no. If, you, if you're in another vehicle besides your Porsche, <laughs> and you tend to do this, stop. <laughs> so go back to 93. If you want to relax one hand, you can still keep the other one there. That's fine. It's not just when you get in traffic conditions or situations, get back two hands on that steering wheel. Okay. And the grip. Be careful of the grip. The other thing is, uh, we'll see, is as we go faster, we tend to start tightening up. And then those, those of our students that are on a DE course the first time and they're going faster and everything's going good, but I look over and I see red knuckles and their fingertips are white and I'm going, relax. <laughs> Take it easy. Let up a little bit. I can, and we've demonstrated this, I can, I can ship with, and steer and ship with my fingertips. At 200 miles an hour, it's not a problem. I won't demonstrate that to you at 200, but the point is, it should be a nice, um, not too firm, but a you know good control of the steering wheel. And I, here's a good way to think of it. Here, hold my canary. Don't, don't let it fly away. Okay, but don't squish it. I want my canary back. Okay, that's a point. You can let it fly. <laughs> so, watch your grip, okay? We got that. Never let go of the steering wheel. <laughs> I've had students do that. They start, especially on a skid pad. We're on a skid pad and they get into their first skid and I tell them it's not going to be the end of the world. The car will only go about maybe at the most 30 feet as it's spinning if you do what I tell you. As a last resort, both feet in, it'll stop. It won't go that far. But don't let, but I've had them. I've had them let go of the steering wheel, close their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I even had, at my training, the police training, I had a recruit start to get out. We always put two students in the car. We're talking to a radio on the skip pad. And, and the car starts skidding, and the next thing I know, I see the passenger door open and the foot coming out, and I'm screaming at him, get your foot in the car and close the door. <laughs> Fortunately, she did. And then I brought him over and chewed her out and said, didn't we tell you? It's not a big deal. Stay in the car. That's the best place for you. All right. <clears throat> I got up there, learn to use shuffle. We, we kind of got away from that terminology, shuffle steering, pre-placement, we call it, pre-placement of the hand steering whenever possible. What I'm talking about, and I'll reinforce this at the break, I'll get my steering wheel and bring it in, but I'm holding the steering wheel, all right? It's divided in half, 12 to six. The left hand stays on the left side, the right hand stays on the right side. If I'm coming into a turn, it's a right-hander, so I'm gonna turn right. My left, right hand slides up to 12 and then pulls the steering wheel into the turn as it slides, my, the steering wheel slides to my left hand. And then where I got it, and that's probably a 90 degree turn. Now my hand's in the middle of the turner, nine and three. If I have to do a further evasive action for whatever reason, I have all this range, don't I? But if I kept my hands perfectly at nine and three, like a lot of racers say, never move your hands, race nine and three. And I get like this, and then I gotta go like this. I got a problem. And what else it does, and well, some of us, how do you turn? Hand over hand? You're taking one hand off the steering wheel. So during that process, you're only driving your steering with one hand. This way here, you're driving with both hands. 
It actually slows down your input and makes it smoother on the steering. And it works. If you're going to try this, I want you to do it in a parking lot first. And once you get the hang of it, it'll become automatic. Do it every, you know, while you're driving. And then if you want to go out and do performance driving, you'll, you'll be doing it automatically. You won't have to think about it. The only time you'll, if somebody may be sitting next to you and go, what are you doing? You look like an old person driving, chucking your hands all over. No, I'm smoother. Slower, but smoother, okay, and more precise. Just to let you know, the BMW, especially International, they are big proponents of hand over hand. So a hand they, over hand? Yes, so when they teach their instructors, that's what they want them to do. I don't do it, but they, that's what they do. Yeah, it's the same thing in our, in PCA, they're, you know, there's a, they poo-poo the shuffle steering. Yeah, and what happens is when, I agree with you. The name came from, when you first start doing it, your hands start making a shuffling sound on the steering wheel. And the first timers will move their hands way too much. Way too much they need to. So that's why we started doing pre-placement hand position. And you're just planning ahead. And it actually makes it's making you think ahead, planning for that turn. Because you see it coming, you're moving your hands right, and you're in, it's always in a good position. You, I'm not saying you have to do it, but it's just an option, okay? As I said, it allows for better control. Um, but it requires practice and is easily met, um, mastered. And of course, we already talked about the depth through it. This is one of my, let's see, if it's going to play. No, that's not it. <laughs> I should have done that. All right. You'll see that one at the end. Okay, vision. This is one of the most important techniques. Your ocular driving technique. How you use your eyes. This is the second bullet. You drive where you look. We drive where we look. Want proof? <clears throat> you ever been on a roadway and you see these skid marks? And there's a big oak tree and the skid marks. <laughs> Straight of the oak tree. Guess what the driver, the last thing they saw before the crash? The tree. What were they staring at? The tree. So they drove where they looked, into the tree. If you get in situations, critical situations, you want to note the trees, the guardrail, the other car, whatever it is, and then get your eyes where? Where we need to go. go to escape, the escape route. Does that make sense? And that may take some, you know, a couple times you have to work yourself into this. Because, you know, I don't want to look at the, I don't want to have it. I don't want it to happen and I'm going to stare at it. No! If the deer runs out in front of you, are you going to watch it the whole time? Here comes the deer, right? My right to my left. Oh, there's the deer. <laughs> oh, I hit it. Oh, stupid deer. No. No. So, and believe me, this works. I'm telling you, it works. Work on it. I've had in um, Street Survival, I taught this in several, that day, that night, I'll get a phone call from one of the fathers and said, Dan, my son drove home. Deer ran out in front of us. Are you guys okay? No, we listened to you. Yeah, we're okay, but we listened to you. Didn't have a problem. He drove towards the opening. He noted the deer, drove to the opening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I've had others, you know, military, drivers for military and, and um, State Department and stuff. Same thing. Contact us later and say that was one of the best techniques, you know, <laughs> how to avoid those issues. So it works. Here's something, it may sound contradictory, but it makes sense. See everything, focus on nothing. We want you out there all the time, looking as far as you can. My instructors, when they're in a car with a student on a road course, they have to see 360 degrees all the time. I'd say it's imperative. You have to know what's going on 360 degrees around you all the time. We can't 
We can try and do that as a driver by checking our mirrors and scanning out and avoiding staring. Anybody here fly? You mean target fixation? Yes. Avoid target fixation. Yes. Flying. Do you keep staring ahead? No. No, you do what? You're scanning, scanning all the time, correct? Yeah. You have to. Well, even more in instrument conditions. You yes. Be looking around. Correct. So you don't get one of the problems, inverted. <laughs> Which way's up? No, that's down right now, buddy. You're in trouble. <laughs> so yes, scan as much as you can. Target fixation, avoid that. Avoid it, right? Anytime you have a question or you disagree or you want to talk about it, speak up. I won't. I won't throw the stick. <laughs> All right, vision skills. We want you ideal conditions. There's no cars in front of me. It's uh, even on the mountain roads. We'll say two to three seconds look ahead. But those are pretty much on the straight parts. When we get in the curvy parts, you'll see later, I'll tell you, three to four seconds. You want some room, you want some buffer room. But two seconds ahead, what am I talking about? Remember, when I went to DE, there were what? Every time 10 miles, you have a what? Car, car length in front of you. Yeah. Okay, define car length to me. Somebody tell me, which car are you talking about? <laughs> when you're saying it, you may be thinking about a Volkswagen Beetle. I may be thinking about a Cadillac. The old Cadillacs, the real long ones, with all that chrome. Twice the length of a beetle. <laughs> That's my point. So we wait, we decide, well, let's try seconds. So when the car in front of you passes a fixed object, a telephone pole or a tree, as soon as they pass it, you start counting, you're driving behind them. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and then you pass it on, three seconds. As your speed increases, that distance is actually going to increase. So you'll be more than one car length for every 10 miles per hour. You'll be a greater distance between. It's a good, good technique to use. Four seconds, conflicts in inclement weather, darkness, okay? When you're driving, look at least 12 seconds down the road, your sight picture. If you're in a city, 12 seconds is only about six blocks, maybe four. <laughs> if it's like that, Maybe 10 minutes. <laughs> if the road was clear, it would be 12 seconds, but it's going to be longer in this situation. All right? Okay. Weight transfer. Can I throw something out? Of yes, go. Go. Uh, when you drive from up north down into Asheville, uh, the last hour is in the mountains. Hmm. And at night, it's pretty twisty and hard to see. So my wife slows down to 40 miles an hour, and I go whenever I get there. And I say to her, find a car in the right lane and leave it like uh, you know a few hundred yards ahead of you. You can't put your brights on because there's oncoming cars going on the curb. If that car hits something, you'll know. It. So <laughs> what about what about if the car disappears? You'll know. <laughs> <laughs> If you can't see 200 feet ahead of you, you know that the car in front of you was just there. So that gives a little safety. Anybody here have the Porsche Dynamic uh, lighting yes. option? Yes. Where, the, where the lights? No. That's awesome. I'll get it on your next car. <laughs> <laughs> we have it on our Macana. I wish I had it on my GT4. <laughs> The previous owner didn't order, but you can see around the curves. It's, and in the mountains, hill, it's fantastic. <laughs> Two seconds is actually reaction time. I mean, it's not stopping time. We'll talk about that. That's a good point. He said that two seconds is actually reaction time. It's, we're given a distance there for keeping between us and a car in front of us. But if you're on top of it, and we'll all talk about it briefly, the braking, the total component of braking, of coming to a stop, covers just what you, part of it, just what you said, the reaction time, okay? That's why, again, vision is important. Scanning way ahead, watching what's going on, paying attention. Actually, the T word. Oh no, Mr. Dan, not T word. You mean I have to think? 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. When we're driving, we have to think. We have to avoid the distraction. Okay. Topic two, weight transfer. Okay, engineers, don't get upset with me. So, we have two types. Longitudinal weight transfer, and then sideways. Okay? So longitudinal, when we're at normal, when we're driving at a normal speed, or a constant speed, say 50 miles an hour, or standing still, the vehicle is pretty much level, correct? I put water in this car to demonstrate that, that so it makes it a little more obvious what's going on. Under a, a, a braking, especially heavy braking, the weight shifts to the front end. Now when I say this, engineers, it's just a little bit of weight. It's not like there's a big weight or water in the car moving forward. No. What we're talking about is the front end of the car will dip. Why is it dipping under braking? Because gravity is higher than the wheels. Well, he just said weight transfer, but weight doesn't move. Uh, the engineers are telling you the weight really can't move. The center of gravity of the car is above the road, so it brings it Okay, forward. and the mass is moving slightly forward compared to at the point where the wheels are meeting the traction point, okay? Because of the, what makes the car ride nice? Suspension. Suspension. <clears throat> it has springs. It's going to move a little bit. Also, what else? This round thing is made out of rubber. Rubber is flexible. It's a spring. So you have several springs and you're moving it slightly. Does that make sense? Okay. Am I okay, engineers? You're doing <laughs> not gonna... Under acceleration, the opposite. The front raises, the rear squats. So what's really going on when that happens? Think about the tires. And if I'm moving a little bit of weight, so under braking, I'm moving a little bit of weight forward. Remember that traction point I talked to you about? Do you think that's going to get a little bit bigger on the front tires under braking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and under acceleration? The rear tires are going to have more traction than the front, right? Correct? Okay. So that's why you have a front-wheel drive car, because that, that has the best traction going. That's what we were told when they came out. Well, if I'm under acceleration, which wheels are making the car go? The front. And especially in slippery conditions or in snow. Well, that car, will, it'll work really great in the snow. Really? You think so? Your steering gets real light when you're going faster and you're going wide. Well, where'd the weight go? For traction purposes. Towards the rear. <laughs> so there, here's a different way to look at it. This is a, from the top. There's your tire traction point. This car is what? Under acceleration. See the front? Smaller, smaller. It's a front engine. Rear wheel drive. Okay? Terrible configuration. <laughs> so, what would you rather have? What's the best configuration? Mid engine. Mid engine. Mid engine. There we go. I bring that up. Okay. The first Porsche, the first 356, what was it? Where was the engine? Rear. 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 Back of the other. Mid engine. Mid -engine. It was mid engine. The 356, number 001, was mid-engine. Look at the photo, okay? You'll see his car, he has his uh, kids in the back. They're sitting on the engine. The engine was in front of the transaxle. The only reason he had to go to rear engine, rear wheel drive, because of the money. It was, at that time, too expensive to produce. He wanted his cars to be mid-engine. Rear wheel drive. His race cars were, and he and he designed and actually raced them in the auto union, was a mid-engine car, sports race car. Okay? 
So I like to use that because I am a mid-engine guy. I've always, I've had a lot of mid-engine Porsches, raced them, and I still have one now. And that's why I love to throw out, because the 911, sorry, don't get upset with me, but the purists go, oh no, the engine's gotta be in the back. Really? The latest 911 race car, the RSR, where's the engine? Mid-engine, and if a, a Porsche employee tells you it's mid-engine, they get fired. And that's the truth. The icon, you can't, you know, Okay, so you see, longitudinal, while breaking. That's pretty dramatic, but that's, a, that's the real thing. It wasn't doctored, okay? Acceleration, dragster. <laughs> Anybody have or know of the, um, what was that car? The Yugo. Oh, yeah. You know, it's banned in this country. You can't sell it if it's a used one, or you can't, you're not supposed to sell it. Too much the reason power. is, <laughs> yeah, too much horsepower. If you ever look under the hood, the engine, it's front wheel drive, the engine's there, but the engine is sticking way in front of the transaxle, okay? And they put a spare tire in, on top of the engine, too. All the weight's on the front. This is no, this is no lie. The reason they... I don't, I, I don't make this up. I don't have to. It's there. <laughs> a lot of my friends will hear my, my cop stories and they go, oh, damn, that didn't happen. <laughs> yes, it did. Yes, it did. <laughs> I don't have to make this up. Um, the Yugo went it under heavy braking, the rear wheels would com come completely, both of them, off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right, off the ground. It was not, it was not a well handling car. <laughs> All right. Lateral weight transfer, here we go. Now we're going through turns. So we turn right. So this car is going that way. Where's the weight going? It's gonna to go to the left a little bit. In fact, the body will lean to the left. As we're going straight, it's level, and then the opposite going left, the car, the body will lean to the right. Now, with our cars, most of our Porsches, that's not gonna happen much, is it? Because the suspension's pretty tight. And we have other components that are helping minimize that, okay? The sway bars, but don't, don't misdrew what sway bar means or what it does. It doesn't prevent the swaying of the car body of doing that. Now, Dan, isn't the force still there? It the, just, the what? The force? <coughs> yes. The force is still there. The car yeah. didn't sway. Yeah. So you still have that problem with the tire on that side. That's right. Yeah. And that, that's what I'm leading to. So he's talking about that. That's what I'm going to explain. He's talking about very big. He's talking about the tire. When the body sways, it's going, if it's swaying or turning left and the body's swaying right, which tires are going to have less traction on the left? And if the car really sways, you may what? Pick up one of those tires. Like a front wheel drive, a GTI will do it. You know, yeah, a lot of the front wheel drive cars in a, in a turn at speed will lift up the rear inside wheel. I mean, I've seen it enough that you could put a Coke bottle under that bad boy. <laughs> now, there was tricks we could do, but what it does, the sway bar, this car is leaning that way, the body is leaning that way. The way the sway bar is attached, it forces that inside wheel to come down. So it tries to keep as much traction on the inside wheels. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's how it, it really works. It doesn't, it doesn't. Dan, yeah. over, over there, Thomas has it. Oh, yes. What about a strut race? Oh, in the um, tower. Yeah. Yeah. Like we did in 911. So, Wet Weltmeister came out the first one. Okay. He's talking about your shock towers, on a, especially in 911, if you opened up the front bonnet, the hood, and um, where the shocks attach to the body, okay, we would put on the early cars, even the later cars, we would put a brace in between those shock towers. But, but you may not know this, because those towers flex. And what a lot of people thought is, under heavy corner, and they flex like this. They don't flex that much this way. They flex a lot 
this way. Mm -hmm. And the Weltmeister, the, the bar is actually minimized the expansion, not so much, but it does, it does both. But primarily it was made to, to minimize this, to expand it out. Good. So, so Good. is that? That helps. That helps, yeah, it does, it helps. Okay, okay? it does help. Um, some of us are with, uh, with the front engine cars, when we were competing, like a GTI, I would put, uh, the trick was I put two sway bars on the rear. And you, and you very rarely lifted the inside rear wheel. It's just, it's, you know, you're trying to keep all tires on the ground. So you see, what's, what's the most important factor is when we're driving? Traction. Traction, that's what we're, that's the game. We gotta maximize our traction. All right. Now turning, this car is turning to the right, <coughs> okay, and you see, right side or left side is loading up because, wait, we're leaning a little bit over there, okay, let's say we were braking at the same time we're doing this, what footprint would be really large? Left front. In fact, the car is literally pivoting on the left front. Yeah, you can. You could lose the rear end too. Right. Correct. So there's demonstrations of lateral. See the car. The the dodge is going to the right. It's starting to lean to the left. Front wheel drive, right here, going to the left. Cars leaning to the right. All right? Good so far? Here we go! What is this? Mini Cooper, yeah, the original Mini Cooper in a rally. Look at that. Lots of air. What? Hey, Dan. Oh, sorry. We're going to sit cross states where you can. Yes. Yeah. Where does four wheel drive? I know 4S fit in all this. All wheel drive, four wheel drive. <clears throat> You're still going to have the traction difference. It's going to be the same. All, what that all wheel drive and four wheel drive does, if you have a truck, most of the time you have four wheel drive and you can switch, you know, you can go two wheel to four wheel. Um, with a lot of our Porsches, our four-wheel drive, yeah. crossovers, four-wheel drive. And now, and most of our SUVs are just, they call them all-wheel drive, because that's what they're doing. They're all all four wheels are under power. It's just that, how much power is going to which wheels? Now in our Porsches, especially the SUVs, the Macans, the Cayennes, you have gauges now that'll show you where your traction's going. Wow. And, and they're smart, <laughs> because they're using or really didn't. It's a good thing. I'll, I'll answer it. But we're um, we're using a lot of other sensors in the car, and the primary one is the ABS sensor. Now it's it's doing triple duty for us. It's looking at the wheel rotation under power, and it's if it senses that the front wheels are spin are spinning, they're losing grip. They're spinning faster than the rear wheels. Their rotation then it'll divert more power to the rear wheels and less to the front till we get traction back. And then once the wheels start spinning at the same rate, then it'll, it'll redirect more power to the front wheels. So it's moving back and forth. Does that make sense? Okay. Some um, all-wheel drive or four-wheel, like Land Rover, Porsche has done this on some of the vehicles, but it's not, They'll separate, each wheel will be independent as far as getting how much power. And the Land Rover will actually, because I, I taught that too, um, off-roading for Land Rover for a while. And to climb rocks, you go slow. You go as slow as possible. You use the brake, that's your best pedal. But as it's climbing, if one wheel starts to slip, you'll, you'll actually walk, hear it slip and see it slow down, almost stop, and then it starts gripping. And then it starts getting more power. And then it starts moving. It's just like, wow. 
And this is, they were doing that on the land, on Land Rovers back in the mid 80s. So they were pretty ahead of the game, you know, so. Even but it's a great on down. It's a, a what? Even more fun going down there when you just yes. let off the gas and. Yes, now, now, right, our, four, our Cayennes and, it, and uh, Macans going downhill, it'll actually control your speed so you don't lose, you know, so it maintains that track. So, so these like, um, these uh, nine, nine 11s that have like 4S, mm -hmm. what kind of, um, is it, it's not proportional, is it? It's only proportional front to rear, or rear to front. Yeah. Yeah, and, and at first, when the first ones came out, you only had like 32% uh, <clears throat> max to the front wheels, and the rest was on the back rear wheels, on the 911s especially. Right. So that's changed a little bit because they got smarter. They did more, you know, there's more electronics involved in there. Yes, sir. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, I think I know, but how Porsche stability management affects? I'm, I'm going to get it. That's the third section. We'll yes. talk about the electronic nanos. <laughs> okay, but we will talk about it. I'm covering it. I'm not going into detail, but I'll give you enough that you'll understand what to do and what not to do. <laughs> In situations, but yeah, I'll explain it. Good, good point. Okay, do we need a break? I was going to go to like another. Let's break. About what time did we start, Jim? About seven o'clock. It's been about. Oh yeah, let's break. Uh, ten minutes. Okay.